Hello Lazio all over the world, welcome to another episode of Lazio Lounge, I'm Vittorio Campanile and I don't know, my friend Alison McKenzie, should we start immediately talk about the ref or shall we start from, you know, something else? Because I guess we have plenty of things to talk about the referee this time, well, this time, also the last time, <laughs> we had plenty of things, I have plenty of things to talk about the referee. It looks like the Serie A is doing me a sort of favor, right? If, <laughs> if, if a lack of argument then let, let's put the referee uh, to give Vittorio some more things to talk about. I mean, Alistair, um, I don't know, uh, Rovella scored an unbelievable goal. I was so excited, so happy for him. He ran all the way from, uh, on the other side of the pitch where the Lazio fan was, and then they disallowed that goal. I mean, that was dreadful. I, I, I didn't, honestly, that was a very uh, soft decision from the ref very soft foul from my point of view i know scottish football is completely different so maybe you have a different point of view but what's your take let's start from that right from the rovella's goal disallowed well um first of all i'm amazed by your patience the it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's monday lunchtime almost and you've like a you know a good child at Christmas who's not unwrapping his presents too fast you know you've waited since Thursday night and the Isaacson penalty you've you've stayed you've held your tongue you've waited overnight after this game against Parma so you must be ready to explode Vittorio um, and I'm not surprised to be honest this time I I've, I found a positive about the Ravella goal right hear me out here. Uh, if you remember, I think maybe two, two, three weeks ago, when we were really singing Ravella's praises and saying he's not yet being recognized for how well he's playing and the fact that he's one of the best midfielders in the league this season. And I said uh, that he's trying to add goals to his game and he's been taking all these shots and Baroni's been talking about wanting to add goals I said, well, once those shots start flying in, people will start paying attention. And the good news is, because that goal didn't count, you know, maybe people won't pay as much attention, <laughs> despite it being an unbelievable shot from distance, curling away from the goalkeeper. You know, maybe we'll get another, uh, I don't know, a, a bit more time of Ravella flying under the radar. But yeah, no, it... It's not the way we want to use VAR, is it? I mean, do you want to where do you want to explain what happened first, and then we can? Well, the thing it? is, there's a big question mark because uh, Rovellas, I don't remember. He stole the ball from from a Parma player, and then the ball went to Keta. That is not our Keta, our former Keta, but the Parma player who didn't control the ball. I would say control the ball like Alaza does. And then Pellegrini jumped in and took the ball and we scored. So from a point of view, that's another action, right? So the VAR should have intervened because you cannot pick another action. I mean, you have to uh, take the, the in consideration only the, the goal chance that Lazio created. So that should have been out of the VAR. But instead, the VAR uh, took that uh, the frame. Uh, was it a foul? Could be. I mean, if you take the screenshot, then everything is a foul, right? Um, but from my point of view, that was another chance. So it should have been uh, brought up by the VAR system, uh, which is the biggest question mark and the biggest concern I have. Uh, for me, could have been a foul, very soft. But, you know, I, I think we are using, well, said yeah, using the VAR in the wrong way. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing people are most angry about is the use of VAR and like this really isn't what it was supposed to be for. Um, I mean, the fundamental thing that we always have to come back to with VAR is like it's there as like a, a backup to prevent referees from making decisions that affect games if they've missed clear and obvious errors. And the point you're making there about is this a foul or not yeah, it could be. If he'd blown the whistle in midfield, I don't think anyone would have, you know, paid too much attention to it. But the fact is, it's not a clear and obvious error either, because he's not, you know, his, 
it's one of those that you can give, you can you, you could give or you couldn't give, and no one would really notice. And then it's the question of how far back do you go? Because the way you explained it there made it sound almost like Keita gives the ball away and Lazio score. But no, this all happens within Lazio's half. They still have to spread the ball out wide, get up the pitch and get it back inside before Ravella takes this shot. So there's, I don't know how long, there's a decent amount of time between that whole thing happening and the ball actually flying into the goal. And to bring the whole thing back and deny that goal for a foul that is really a grey area foul for me is not a big error, even if it is a foul. I just don't think that's what VAR is there to be used for. And I just don't know what is going on with Italian referees this season. Um, generally, I think over the last few years, there's always certain cases and certain moments that people complain about. But generally, I would say the introduction of VAR in Italy hasn't been nearly as kind of controversial and I guess as much of a big talking point in the last few years as it has been in other places, certainly in the Premier League. Um, but this year has just been littered with bad decisions. And this is a terrible one. Um, I made a, a, a joke in our group chat yesterday about the fact that, you know, on the day this happened, there was a double page spread interview in Corriere dello Sport with, with uh, Roma's sporting director just complaining about all the refereeing decisions that have gone against them. But I think pretty much every team almost by this point will have like a, a book <laughs> full, filled with moments because the refereeing is just every week there's this bad decisions going on. And for me, this is one of them. And Alistair, can we say something? Every time the ref has been called by the VAR, he considered the, the penalty or disallowed the goal, etc. Except on Thursday, when the penalty was crystal clear, I would say, on his accent. But the ref went, didn't concede the penalty and then was going to the VAR, already shaking his head, like saying, I'm not giving it that penalty anyway. So, again... It's embarrassing because, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't remember a single case where the ref went to the VAR and didn't change his uh, his opinion. But it's not the technology that is wrong. It's the people that are using the, the technology. The ref on Thursday should be banned forever because he didn't want to admit that he was wrong. And he didn't. And Lazio has been punished because you get the penalty, you probably score, the game is over. So this is the problem. We are not talking about the, the technology. It's the people that are using the technology. If you are a bad ref, you're going to be a bad ref on the pitch or using VR uh, at home or wherever you do it, right? Yeah, and that's, that's what I mean. That's the thing that's baffling me a bit with all this is that the technology hasn't changed. Um, and I guess the, the way they're supposed to implement it hasn't really changed so I, I don't really understand why all of a sudden so many bad mis decisions are being made across the league week on week. Um, okay. I, this is supposed to be the point by which we're kind of used to VAR and we're used to the technology and we're used to, you know, the odd bad thing happening. But generally, um, my take on it has been is, it's a good thing because most of the time you get the right decision in a way that you didn't previously. But now it's just, if you're going to get these big delays and this kind of forensic, uh, you know, detailed look at tiny bits of contact 30 seconds before a goal, that is, that's going back right to the start of when this was implemented and the things we were complaining about then. That's not what it's supposed to be for. You know, it's supposed to be a last resort thing to help referees if they've missed something crazy, something obvious. That this isn't supposed to be what, and to deny moments like that as well that's that's what frustrates fans you you mentioned yeah. you know he he's that's the one thing that's been missing from Rovella's season has been that these shots fly in and he scores this absolute screamer and you say he runs to the other side of the pitch there's like 5000 Lazio fans there and he's beating beating his chest beating the badge it's an amazing moment in his season in Lazio's season and that whole thing is denied because of this petty kind of microscopic judgment. It's uh, frustrating. Alistair, Baroni said that the goal we considered that was 
for me, more a mistake from Provedel rather than uh, uh, Rovella. Uh, Baroni said that a little bit of that mistake is due to the fact that a couple of minutes earlier, Rovella did all that run, celebrated, and then the goal was disallowed. So he thought mentally he wasn't back in the game yet. Uh, do you agree with Baroni? Do you think that the goal disallowed had an impact on Parma's first goal? I think if he said so, then probably, yeah. I mean, it's you can you can easily see how that would happen because it's a bad mistake um, and a pretty simple mistake and not generally the kind of mistake he, he makes. He's not someone who's sloppy in possession. Um, and it is the kind of thing that just takes a little bit of distraction to be guilty of that stray pass. And Parma were pressing so high up with about four players on the defensive line and you should be able to judge that better. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was such a frustrating day all round, wasn't it, Vittorio? Because it was, it was, I, I guess the one thing was Lazio did still, particular in the second half, they stuck to their guns, they stuck to their identity, they really tried to play the way they wanted to play. Um, but they were let down by these moments, these individual mistakes and... Um, well, Alistair, even in the first half, I mean, we scored once. We we had two huge chances. Let's not forget that Castellano headers was saved. I don't remember if Valeri saved that one uh, on the line. And then Isaac said, again, Valeri this time, I'm sure it was him, save it on the line. I mean, two goals saved from on the line. That's not something that happened every single time, right? Uh, <clears throat> Zaccani's penalty, we still didn't talk about it. I mean, the first half should have finished 3-0 for Lazio, finished 1-0 for Parma. That's incredible, really. That's, I, well, more rather than incredible, it's very Lazio style, right? Yeah, and in that sense, it was a bit of a freak result. Um, because, you know, even the second goal is another, obviously another individual error from, from Hila losing the ball. But even then... Um, I don't think you can just blame Gila for that because I think Providel gets caught completely out of position. Yeah, nobody um, says nobody says that, but for me, Providel makes a bigger mistake there. That, not yeah. well, obviously it, he, he makes it look like an amazing goal, but it's not. It doesn't have to be really because he just has to lift it over him. If he was, yeah. you know, a few meters back where he should be by that stage, you can make the save. But and and it also it was a. Once Gila loses the ball, it's still like four Lazio defenders against three attackers. You know, they, they shouldn't be um, still. It's not like they're getting cut open in the way that the third goal was. So, yeah, it was a frustrating one to lose as well, that one. Provedel said that they were all out because they were waiting for the pass. But I don't see nobody there that he could pass the ball to. And you're the goalkeeper. Stay a couple of meters behind. And then, I mean, if... We are desperate. You can rush out. But that made it too easy. That made it too easy. I thought Provedel didn't have a great performance yesterday. yesterday. Uh, the first goal, yes, Rovella is to blame, but I thought Provedel could have passed the ball better. And in the second goal, yeah, Gila again. And uh, this is not the first time that Gila comes out from the line and loses the ball. But Provedel has to do better. There are some days where Provedel reminds me of Strakosha, right? <laughs> um, oh, going too far there, Vittorio. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess what, what we can take from all of that, though, is probably that we've been saying from the start of the season how the, the Baroni style of football is kind of you're taking that balance of risk and reward, and yeah, you're happy with the level of risk because you feel you can achieve the the reward. And this is probably the biggest um, case we've had, the best, biggest example we've had so far of when that goes wrong, when the balance flips the other direction, because it kind of is from taking those risks that the goals are conceded. You know, it's from trying to play through a really high press for the first one, instead of just avoiding the Parma press. And the second one is a centre-back trying to run the ball out of his own half and losing it. And those are, you know, with a high line and all that. And these are all things that are 
part of the way Baroni wants to play football, and that and that so far has worked, you know. Um, and so I I didn't actually end the game feeling like oh, a Ludogorets draw and now this and this means Lazio are now in decline and this this great start is over. I didn't feel like that really because I did see still the same Lazio. It was just kind of these moments, you know, the goals that didn't go in or the goal leg clearances, like you say, the VAR, the the, the penalty discussion and uh, the save Suzuki made. And it was just one of those days, you know. Um, I, I didn't end the game feeling like Lazio, this is the collapse of Baroni's Lazio in any, by any means. No, collapse, it's a bit too much, but... I don't know if you agree with me, but in the first half, especially when Duzi lost a lot of stupid balls, we made some bad mistakes in midfield. Uh, we didn't move the ball as fast and quick and as uh, well as we did in the past. Uh, we'll have to talk about our midfield, Alison, because it's when Duzi Rovella playing all the time. Uh, Vecino is out for, uh, for an injury. He's going to miss the next two games against uh, Napoli. Coppa Italia and Serie A probably could be back for the Ajax game, the away game. But with Rovella, and we didn't mention who got the yellow card yesterday, he's going to be suspended for the Napoli game. And at the moment, we have Jess Winduzi available from the midfield on for Sunday. So that's where I'm more concerned. And we said it here, I don't know how many times, uh, we don't have that many options with Cataldi gone. And... Uh, I hope we're not going to pay the price now in this very important games against Napoli, Atalanta, Ajax. I mean, this is, I don't want to say the, 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 the decisive month for, for Lazio, but it's going to be important, right? If you win against big teams, then uh, it's going to be important for the table. But I mean, we have only win to see. Uh, Baroni said that Castrovilli will be back soon. I, I mean, I won't start Castrovilli against Napoli after. He missed three months of playing. Yeah, and um, also it was a shame that Deli Bashiru's been given that chance yesterday. He's not really taken it. Um, again, probably he's not quite playing in the position that's his strongest because it was more of a 4-3-3 than a 4-2-3-1 yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And I think he's better if you push him up the pitch. Um but that that is an issue too it's not just like who do we have available it's well how how well are they playing and the difference between selecting Deli Bashiru or Castrovilli compared to Guendouz and Ravella who have been amazing all season generally um it's a big drop we've we've been seeing this coming for a long time though Vittorio, haven't we I mean now we are in a at, at this crazy position where it's the Coppa Italia on, on Thursday night Napoli and uh yeah, like Toma Basic and Akba Pro are back in the discussion because they're actually allowed to play in this tournament. I mean, there would probably be no greater message to Fabiani and Lodito for January than us having to go back to the guys who haven't even made it into the squad this season. I can see Akba starting on, on Thursday. Do you think I mean, so? Starting. Yeah, I mean, uh, Rovella's playing because he's not playing on Sunday, but when does he has to rest? I mean, let's not forget that the, the season doesn't end on Sunday. Then we have Ajax away, then we have Atalanta, and so on. Uh, so it's not... I mean, till uh, Christmas, we're playing every three days. So uh, we have to rotate. I mean... The the question, all hard games as well. Yeah, I mean, again, we were mentioning Castrovilli. Uh, I hope he's fit for Sunday, but... It would be a huge risk starting him on Sunday uh, against Napoli. So, Akpa, I think he... Let, let's point out something that maybe our listener doesn't know. Akpa Pro, Basic, Andre Anderson and Isai are all training with the squad. They're not out of the squad. Uh, simply, they're not in the list, in the UEFA list and in the Serie A list, so they cannot be called. But they're training with the team. So, it's not that they're not training, they're not doing... Uh, the, the 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 tactical schemes with the with the players etc so yes obviously akba hasn't played since may i think but he's there so i think he could start against napoli uh because if we have to pick uh, 
two competition is Europe League and Serie A. Coppa Italia is the last one. So if we go out immediately from the Coppa Italia, I, I wouldn't be ashamed. Uh, and uh, yeah, you give a breather to, to Windows. He, he needs it. Uh, I, honestly, I was thinking I would start even his eye instead of Pellegrini because Nuno Tavares is not fit yet. So, I mean, we, ha we have to rest players. Our list is so thin that we need to. Yeah, I mean, there, there's the team talk, Baroni. If you're if you're looking for some notes, Vittorio's just giving you the inspiring team talk for Thursday. Huh? <laughs> if we're gonna give up on one competition, this one's it. Now go out there, guys. Um, now you're probably right. Well, you're definitely right. The Coppa Italia is the bottom of the priority list. Um, the shame of it is that obviously you're. It's a, it's a competition you don't have to do that much to end up in the final uh, you obviously have to win against big teams but you only have to play a handful of games but yeah it's it's also to do with this run um, coming up because it's, it's a shame that we've had these two bad results drawing at home to Ludogorets we can call a bad result I think considering they, they'd only got one point from four games before then uh, Lats who were top of the table. Okay, it's difficult playing against a six man defense, but. Alistair, was... I know you're used to Scottish football, but when did you see a six man defense in Europe League? I mean, that was, was... astonishing. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, Trapattoni yeah. should have been so happy about that. Yeah. <sighs> no, um... yeah. It... I, I don't know if I've ever seen that. Actually. <laughs> I mean, I guess it was supposed to be a kind of four with two wing backs, but they didn't play like wing backs. No, um, I, I mean, I, I thought that the, the the manager, if he could, he could have put, he would have put another goalkeeper as well. You know, two goalkeepers, six defender, no strikers. That's it. <laughs> we, we have to point yeah, out something. But, but anyway, the point I was going to make was that the it's not so much about the cup it being the cup Italia. It's more that if you look at the fixtures after this, Sunday away to Napoli, yeah. next Thursday away to Ajax, the following Monday at home to Inter, then away to Lecce, then at home to Atalanta, and then the Derby, and that's all in the space of the next month. That's uh, one, two. That's seven games in the next month, and what, Christmas all, in the middle. all but Lecce are against big teams. With all due respect to Lecce, are you sure? Uh, yeah, yeah. Are, are you shaking your head because the derby was one of the games I mentioned? <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we forget, Lazio's qualified for the knockout stage in the Europe League already after the draw against Ludogorets. So that's important, but obviously we need to try to finish in the top eight. So we skip that knockout stage and go directly to the uh, final draw uh, of the Europe League. That would be really important. Uh, but yeah, Alasso, I think uh, I agree with you when I say that Lazio played well. Lazio deserved to win against uh, Parma. We made three mistakes, but the game is still there. We, we play football, great. The, the biggest concern I have, Alistair, is our midfield. Uh, Vecino out, Rovella out. We don't have that many options. And you were talking about Dele Bashiru. Um, it wasn't easy, I agree with you. And uh, it looks like he's the only option. Or you have my plan, right? Do you remember, Patrick, midfielder? I mean, it's going to happen, right? Because do you start Castrovilli against Napoli? Do you play Dele Bashiru there? I can see Patrick Winduzi playing on midfield on Sunday. Not Gila. I think yeah, I could also see Gila doing yeah, stepping in there. I mean, maybe not now that he's lost the ball in midfield to concede a goal against Parma, but um, yes, you uh, might have to get a little bit creative. Um, yeah, I mean, Ravel and Guduzzi are just so important. We've known this for. The whole time i think it's just also with some other injuries impacting the team you know i think losing Tavares and dia at the same time has been um you know that that has an impact as well especially Tavares. i think we're really missing to you yeah. know that ludicrous game is a great example like having his penetration and pace and directness all of that not to mention he's got 
about 57 assists already this season. Yeah, I, I think we missed his crossing rather than his pace, etc. I thought Pellegrini and Lazzari, uh, even yesterday, they played well. But every time Lazzari was putting the ball in the box, uh, the first one went directly in the curva. The second one went directly on a on a corner kick. I mean, uh, it's difficult, but if you don't put the ball in the box, we're never going to score, right? That's what we're missing. Same thing about Pellegrini. <laughs> I thought he played well, but you know, you get to the end of the of the of the pitch. Now you have to put it in the box, but put it in the box, not outside. Well, that's really so frustrating because he's so good at getting into yeah. those positions, and he did an amazing play yesterday where he, he kind of cut in from the side and managed to. I don't know if he not make the defender anyway. He won a kind of one on one with a defender, came into the box, and I'm like, oh my god, this is perfect. And then his cross just went past everybody. It was too high and just went over the entire box. Uh, but, yeah, so, yeah, you're right. Tavares's delivery, it makes you appreciate it when you've got Lazzari as the, the example on the other side. But, um, yeah, I think squad management size, uh, squad management wise, this is the biggest challenge Baroni's got yet because he's been brilliant to that so far, the rotation and keeping people fresh and maintaining the same intensity and all that. But this period of fixtures I've just described is the biggest test of that yet because it's not just the the level of opponent, but it's how frequently these games are. It's while he's trying to juggle injuries and people coming back into the team and tiredness and who can play in which competition, all this stuff. So it's, it's going to be complicated for Baroni. Can we say that uh, Tadi Castellano playing offside is like Lionel Messi playing football? I mean, what a goal he scored yesterday, yesterday again. I, I still remember, I still have in my eyes the goal he scored against Napoli at the Stadio Olimpico. Oh, beautiful. I mean, if we can score even when he's not on offside, that would be great. Does he have... Uh, it would be interesting to know how many offside goals he scored for Lazio and if it's the same number as his actual onside goals. I think more. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yesterday he scored, and I thought in November he didn't score a single goal. Uh, but I couldn't believe it, Alistair. I was watching my mobile phone at the moment because I thought, okay, it's finished. And then Valeri made a great assist to to Tati Castellano, who was, we have to say, we criticize him a lot, but he was good to keep focused because, you know, I thought the, 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 the chance was over and a lot of other people would have done the same. He followed the ball and uh, scored a goal who I hope changed the game, which, which didn't. But I think that gives him a little yeah. bit of boost now, right? I mean, then again, we have to say we've been complaining about having lost goals through individual errors, but Parma can say exactly the same thing for that. But yeah, I was surprised. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it surprised me somehow that it's been that long since he scored it. Um, I kind of hadn't realized it. I think it was five games without a goal or something. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess we just don't focus on it as much anymore as a result of his good start, which is good because it takes the pressure off him a little bit. But him and Dia have both been on dry runs really in the last month or so compared to how they how they started off. So it'd be nice for both of them to start finding the goal a bit more regularly. Um, and yeah, I think it was disappointing going back to Thursday briefly that Noslin and and Chauna particularly when they get those chances couldn't I mean it's difficult you know it's uh, that six man defense we're talking about tight spaces and so on but even so I felt I felt it's a real opportunity to you know to stake your case and um, particularly Noslin I don't know yeah it's finding it difficult I don't know if you understand if you agree with me on this because I thought Baroni Thursday. Make, made a decision. He could have uh, take off Noslin when he put in Pedro, uh, when he took off Pedro. And, uh, you know, Noslin, I thought he was invisible. You take him off, obviously, you confidence-wise, you can kill him for that because, you know, he's finally starting, he didn't play well, and you take him off. So Baroni preferred to keep uh, Noslin happy or don't demoralize him too much rather than winning the game because I thought that if you take off uh, Nozlin instead of Pedro, you have an opportunity. Uh, Nozlin, in the last 20 minutes, hardly touched the ball on Thursday. And uh, so 
I don't agree with that decision, to be honest with you. The team comes first, then the players, right? We could have won the game, and now we will be talking about uh, direct qualification for the Europa League. Yeah. Um, I guess, he, you know, having worked with him previously as well, he probably he knows or he he has faith that there is more to come, you know, that we're just not seeing it yet, but that the player is there. And and I can see why, you know, the, we, we've spoken before about the fact that a lot of money was spent and then more than anyone else in the summer and too much. Uh, and that he was supposed to be and did start the season off as being the kind of the main man there. So, um, yeah, I hope he can find it. Um, find a little bit of form in that position or or just any position really because he's been tried in a few different ones now um I, i'm surprised that it looks to me that there are two different treatments Ch chana got benched on, on thursday and didn't start sunday he didn't play well to be honest on thursday but we can say the same thing about nosling instead nosling stayed on the pitch and chana was benched uh thursday I, let's remind everybody that Chana is 20 years old and uh, Noslin is 25. I, I can see the talent in Chana. Yes, he still have to figure out a couple of things, but you can see the talent there. Uh, Noslin is 25. He's not a youngster anymore. Uh, physically, I have concern. He's very small for playing, especially in European football, and we know that's on Thursday. Uh, I would give more space and opportunity to Chana, who needs to grow up, who can be a very important game player, especially in Serie A, rather than Nosling. Well, I thought Chana made a good impact off the bench yesterday, actually, against Parma. Um, he, his finishing still isn't great, but he was he immediately impacted the game, you know, made good runs, got into good positions. Uh, tested the keeper a few times. So that's something, because I think sometimes his decision-making has been wild. His uh, shooting hasn't been particularly good. Um, but like you say, he's 20. And it's, yeah, it's good competition for places up there. At least there are different options. So they're always going to get time, those guys. Um, the The questions are more obviously in other parts of the pitch, but... Yeah, Alistair, it's it's funny enough. Uh, we still didn't talk about Dia. He was injured. He wasn't called yesterday. Uh, did we miss him? Do you think with Dia starting, we could have won that game yesterday? Yeah, I just think he links the team together really well. Because um, he can score goals, even if he hasn't been recently, particularly. And the way he knits things together between midfield and attack, or the wings and the striker, I think he's... He's a really clever player. I think he's a really good technical player, but he can he can do a variety of different jobs really on the pitch. Um, and yeah, his his fitness issues have been um, have been missed. I think uh, he has been missed. But it was you know I, I think generally yesterday. I mean, also watching the game on on Dazon, um, the, the Italian broadcaster, it it was almost like a. It was like an ode to how good Lazio had been this season because in the final 15 minutes, all these stat boxes kept flashing up. I don't know if you noticed this. And it it was like most goals scored in the final 15 minutes and Lazio were top. It was like most points won from losing positions and Lazio were joint top. Uh, there was another one. I think it was most goals scored in stoppage time. All these things. And it's like, God, that uh, even if we're not going to pull this off, which ultimately we didn't, they really went for it. And you can just see how much that mentality has changed in games where 2-0 down, they still really believed and pushed to get a result from that game and felt that they they can because they have spent the rest of the season doing that. So they don't jinx it. Does, <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. I mean... Not me. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the biggest takeaway from this game is that the big difference compared to the past is that Lazio didn't give up. We try to the last second, right? And this is a different aspect compared to the past, right? Uh, how often with Sarri, we go one nil down and it's over, even if it's the fifth minute of the game. This is a different team. But 
I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about our midfield, honestly. And uh, I think we need a striker who scores more goals. Uh, Hernanes said a couple of weeks that for qualifying for the Champions League, Lazio need a number nine that scores 20 goals. And I don't think Tati Castellano would, would be that. Well, if you consider the offside goals, then probably yes. But the regular goal, he will never reach that number, right? No, so, but between him and Dia, they probably will, which mm, I think is what Baroni is thinking, right? I hope so. But we have to see uh, Dia when he's going to be back. We didn't mention, but he missed the game on Sunday. I don't know if he's going to be fit enough for Thursday. And uh, I don't know, considering how many midfielder we have, Maybe Baroni will uh, try to play a uh, uh, more defensive mind trequartista there. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, even Diaz hasn't been shining. Obviously, uh, with the malaria thing, he's been not training uh, for a week or so. So he lost something in the physical condition. But he started so well the season. Now he's a little bit uh, losing form, right? Yeah, but I think this is the good thing about the way the squad's been used is that we're not totally relying on individuals' form because there there are being little spikes across the team really of who's having a good patch and you know Pedro was on fire while while Dia was struggling and for example and Tati started the, the season really well and you know Ravella now is is absolutely flying and so I think. That's that's a really good example of how the squad's being used. Is where we're not relying. I've said this before, but I'll say it again: we're not relying so much about on the form of individuals because we can afford for people to have an off a few weeks, not being quite to that level. Because generally, the way the squad is being used is allowing the team to still get results and play in the same way with the same intensity. And you know, Matias Akanyi now is probably the informed player in the team. Yeah. He's keeps scoring goals and. Um, starting to have a real impact on the team in that sense but at the start of the season he wasn't the guy so you know I, i'm not too worried about that because i think you can allow for for these dips of form whereas previously you know if immobile stopped scoring for a month lazio basically don't win a game for a month so yeah it's a, it's a completely different uh, team i would say compared to the past uh one last thing i wanted to point it out we didn't have that many options on the bench yesterday because Dia was injured, Vecino was injured, Nuno Tavares was injured, etc. Still, Baroni didn't call any Primavera guy. Uh, were, were you surprised from uh, Baroni's decision? And do you think this is going to continue or maybe on Sunday, if Vecino is still out, he's going to call someone? Well, generally, when these questions are being asked, I fire it right back at you because <laughs> you're the one who pays far more attention to the Primavera than I do. I mean, my question with that is always, do the players exist? Because if they don't, then it's a pretty simple answer. Like, if, if we need a central midfielder, but we don't have any kids ready to go to play at that level, you don't want to destroy their confidence by putting them in too early. And unless there's someone who's absolutely banging the door down and, you know, some people have mentioned this Munoz guy who we signed from, from Barcelona, was it, in the, yeah. in the summer? And But I don't know, I'm not convinced that there are lots of options there. Well, I think you mentioned Munoz. That could be an option because if, if you remember this summer, they would say, yeah, he's going to be uh, splitting between Primavera and first squad. He never have been called for the first squad yet. So this is not a good sign. Uh, we have Bordon. We have a couple of midfielders that could have been called. So, you know, especially, it's not that, okay, we are taking off uh, Castrovilli to give space to La Primavera. We didn't have anybody. Just bring them there to, to see how the, the professional football is. So, yeah, I was surprised, to be honest with you. Now, I don't say that, uh, that Baroni is not going to give chances. But, for example, I don't, didn't understand the last substitution Baroni made. He took off Ravella and put in Nosling, uh, who didn't do pretty much nothing yesterday. And the third goal was because we didn't have any more midfielders, right? So if you see Ravella tired, that could be, eh? I'm not judging for that. You could have brought in a Primavera or maybe Patrick there playing as midfielder and testing, 
rather than nothing that was pretty much invisible yeah i mean i think that was just a kind of like hail mary <laughs> you know try and throw on all the attackers we've got for the final few minutes but you're right because then there was no one left in the center of the pitch and that that was the issue i agree and by the way hail mary works only against the chicago bears unfortunately but we were playing great football i thought if you could give us other five six minutes with that squad i thought we would have created more chances without bringing nosley so i don't want to say we lost because of that decision i thought we would not lose anyway but yeah i think he's giving too many opportunities to nosley and maybe he should have think more about the team but maybe i'm too hard on uh, baroni on baroni and nosley at this point yeah, well, like I say, I think it's. The, I think he just believes that there's more to come from those and he wants to see, or maybe he thinks that there he needs that moment, and like the more chances he gives him to get that moment, the the more chance we're going to get of seeing the real Nuzlan. I'm I'm not sure. Um, but I, I thought. Sorry, I thought he had that moment against Torino when he came in and scored. I thought he had that moment against Genoa when he started and scored. I mean, how many moments do you, do you want to give him? 15? Yeah, but he is an option for the reason you said. He is 25. He is more experienced. He, he is a guy who's, you know, who's come from another Serie A club and has proven himself at this level before. So you can understand why he turns to him as being a, an option. Um I, so I don't have an issue with him getting time off the bench. I guess the, the question would be more if he started starting games in the place of Tati or, or Deer mm. or whatever and taking their places in the team, then you'd probably question it more. But I can understand why he's giving him bench opportunities for sure. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see what happens on Thursday. It's going to be really hard considering the, the, the injury situation for Lazio. Uh Thanks again, Alistair, for joining me. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Please rate and review the podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to support us, our uh, page is patreon.com slash Lounge. Membership starts at $2 a month. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, everybody. We're going to be back after Lazio Napoli. Take care. Cheers.